Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Visit audible.com slash twist for your free audiobook. And by Hiscox. Do you have the proper insurance for your startup? Get the right insurance right now with Hiscox. Tailored coverage starting at only $22.50 a month. Visit hiscoxusa.com slash smallbiz to get a quote. And by Amazon Web Services. Get the resources you need to easily get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups including AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and special offers from third parties. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis here, and this is This Week in Startup. If it's your first time here, where the hell have you been? Uh, this is the show where we talk about building companies, being an entrepreneur, uh, and making crazy wild ideas happen. Today, my interview with Kevin Rose from the Launch Hackathon, which occurred uh, up in San Francisco. And if you're a long-time listener, you know we talked to Kevin back in 2010, and we talked about uh, his first startup, Dig, Revision 3, and it's been a while since he's been on the program. Um, and in that time, Dig was acquired by Betaworks, and he joined Google Ventures. He's done dozens and dozens of angel investing, uh, uh, angel investing dozens of and dozens of companies, and he has the largest syndicate on uh, AngelList, and he's at Google Ventures doing big deals. It's an amazing, amazing um, interview, and uh, what a great guest. Stick around to the end of the episode, and you'll find out if he is ever going to start another company again, or if he's going to be a venture capitalist for the rest of his life. Stick with us. It's a great episode. It's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Um, now, speaking of innovation, um, we're trying to all innovate this weekend. We're trying to build things. Um, the gentleman who I'm going to bring up right now is one of the most innovative, great product thinkers, great entrepreneurs of our time. I met him in 2002 or 2003. He had a little tiny site um, called Dig. And I noticed because I was running Engadget and a bunch of other blogs that Dig started sending one, two, three, four, ten percent of uh, the traffic to those blogs, and I actually tried to buy it. Luckily, he said no uh, for him. Um, but he's been a tremendous entrepreneur and a, and a great friend of mine. Um, and he's going to be super honest with us and give us a lot of great advice. So please welcome to the launch stage, Kevin Rose. And I might add, he was in Dublin, right, for the summit? Yes, founders. Founders. and. Uh, great to see you, brother. Good to see you. Um, and so you're a little bit tired. Oh, I've had a cold and slash flu for the last week, but I'm over it. I won't get any of you sick. Um, right. Still in my chest, though, but <clears throat> well, we glad to be here. We appreciate you coming. Um, you've had a hell of a career, and you're still so young and still, still kicking, still working at yeah. it, uh, <laughs> like we all are. But uh, hey, let's go down memory lane for a second. Let, let's play the video. Oh, boy. What video? Exactly. What video? Okay, team, play the vi slide Please. one. It would be the video. You're joking. We don't have a video. No, it's just a short video. Okay. It's just the beginning of your career. Do we have the video? No video. We can move on. All right. All right, when the video is ready, play it. But you started your career. Um, well, anyway, when I met you, you were on G4. You were produced right Yeah, I was working on, a, on Tech TV at the time, and um, it was then acquired. Uh, it moved down to, oh boy, there it is. All right, here, play it, play it. This is your first... There's a service running that lets uh, spammers, or could let spammers, bombard you with messages. Now, Kevin Rose, you all know, he's usually over there in the NetCam Cineplus, but he's the guy who found this, and people probably no don't know this about you, Kevin, there. but uh, you're a very sophisticated computer user. You run servers at home, you play with Linux, and, 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 and how did you find this uh, whole... Well, just playing around with a couple of friends. You know, we like to take apart computers, just hack them, get into right. them, right. and uh, playing around with Chris Krause from the IT department, good friend of mine, and just uh, started uh, playing around and, and actually started spamming some machines. You, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to do a port scan to find out which machines can be hacked. You need my IP address. Okay, very good. So there you have it, Kevin Rose on... Uh, Early 20s back then. And that, you're in your 20s. That's uh, right. 
So how did you wind up getting that job and then being with obviously the very famous Leo Laporte? Um, how, how did you wind up on G4? As a so uh, I had a friend that worked there at Tech TV and um, I, he had, there was a job opening for kind of someone to work behind the scenes, yeah. set up all their Linux machines and just kind of like do whatever technical setup was necessary for the show. And I just started, you know, doing um, all of that and became friends with the producers and had an idea for a segment. And at one point they were just like, hey, do you want to go on, on TV and talk about this? And so that's what uh, kind of gave me my start. So at the time, um, a lot of you probably remember Slashdot being a pretty popular uh, tech news site. Um, oh, there it is. Wow. I haven't seen that version in a long what time. Like to see that? that's, that's when I did the design. So that's how you, it was it's pretty crappy. Um, I actually had a Wait, better... designed, actually? I, I had a better header. I actually had some design. This is like the Wayback Machine or something, so you get broken images. Um, this was actually probably version like one point something. It was not the fir very first version. It was close to it, though. Um, yeah, wow, that was a long time ago. What do you think when you see that? When you see your first create, it really was your first creation, yes, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I, I had done a couple of other little tiny things that I had coded up and then put on download.com, and that was when I first realized when I created some software, some shareware, put it on download and actually had people pay me for it. I was like, well, I get why Bill Gates is so rich. You write the software once, and then you can just sell it to as many people as you want. Right. And it's like, you don't have to manufacture anything. You just keep copying bits, and you keep making money. It's amazing. Right. And so that's how I knew I wanted to be involved in, in, in the web and, and create something. And so, um, you know, it, it may seem weird, but there really wasn't social voting back then online. Like, there was no way to do it. Like, when you had to dig a story here, like, if you click dig story underneath the item there you would go to another page that would say thank you for your dig because there was no Ajax. So you right. couldn't upload, uh, update the page in real time. And so I remember that when Ajax like, first came out and was supported by the browsers, I was like, okay, well, this will be interesting. Let's see what happens if you make a button where you click it, the vote goes up. And like, I didn't invent voting, but like, that was like, cool. You know, I'd right. never seen that on the web before, you know? Yeah. And, so, and then when we started making dig buttons and then you know, it's, it was cool because I remember Facebook copied us and a few other people started making these little buttons for the web. Right. You remember, you, I mean, you put these on in Gadget and some other sure. sites. Yeah, that was like the big conversation. You were like, hey, can you put these on in Gadget? And we're like, yeah, that's right. Hmm. You're like, I, you're gonna, you wanted to charge me to put them on in Gadget. I know. I was like, well, how much are you going to pay us? Because that's kind of real estate. Um, <laughs> that's right. But it, it is interesting. You think about how innovative. Your mic's down a little bit, by the oh, way. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. When you think about how innovative this was at the time, um, nobody had uh, really done voting to, to, in this way. Not in this way, not on like social content, not, not voting that would then go and syndicate that out socially to your profile, to your friends. Yeah. Like it was, it was different. It wasn't just a, a number going up. There was a lot happening behind the scenes there as well. Um, and was it the first time somebody had put a button on another person's site? I'm trying to remember if anybody had done... This idea of a widget on another person's delicious, site. Delicious, delicious had done it. One of the ones that was I yeah. first saw, um, and then because I became friends with Joshua Schachter, um, then and I asked him, uh, you know, are you creating? I like delicious and I like the popular page. And getting back to the genesis of the site, this is like talking to Joshua. I said it's really cool, but no one's bookmarking news because it's so fast moving. Like there's no, you know, they're bookmarking re favorite recipes and things like that. Um, and he's like, well, I don't really want to do news. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Well, maybe I should try and tackle news and see if kind of the wisdom of the crowds can come together and create something pretty special and, and create an awesome homepage. Um, so uh, things moved pretty quickly after that. Uh, of course, you remember this famous, uh, next slide if we can, this uh, famous cover, pretty brutal. Uh, I'm going to keep you on foundation. I'm going to pull out all your... Yeah, so I'm... <laughs> this is your live camera. But... Um, this was a pretty amazing joke cover, by the way. It, it was like I never. They set you up. I took one photo like that. Right. One photo. It was um, a joke. They were just like, "Oh, mess around, put your thumbs up," and then they right. put the fucking photo and put it on the cover. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it, it did take you from being just a coder who had hacked together a site to people actually started thinking about you as an entrepreneur. Oh yes, Audible, Audible, the leading provider of audio books. I love you so much, and I love you because you keep me smart and you keep me entertained. Um, you can access, of course, your Audible collection anywhere. 150,000 titles are available, and uh, just for our audience, you can get a free audio book right now. 
Go to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist and get your 30 day trial. I am on the platinum program, which means I get like 20 books a year and uh, I love it. I love it. And I'm listening to two books right now. Uh, One is called Born Standing Up. And you say, why would you read that? It's Steve Martin's autobiography, and he reads it himself. Steve Martin, the stand-up comedian. It is hysterical, and it's a great story. Uh, and it's not that long. It's only four hours and three minutes, and uh, I'm about to finish it, actually, on my, on my drive home today. But it makes me laugh, and it really gives me insight into his resiliency and building his career. Um, and then the other one I'm uh, listening to right now is The Bully Pulpit, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard T- Taft, and the Golden Age of Journalism. And hey, we're looking at my library right here. And you can also see Emotional Equations, uh, which I downloaded from Chip Connolly who's going to be on an episode of This Week in Startup shortly. He's the guy who did Joie de Vie Hotels and just a great thinker. We had a really emotional, speaking of emotional equations, discussion. So there's three different books there. I got to think about which one I want to advise you to get. And uh, I'm going to go with Born Standing Up. I think you have to branch out a little bit and understand what else is going on in the world and hearing other people and these stand-up comedians, they're great entrepreneurs. I mean, you really hear how Steve Martin built his career uh, with this wonderful, wonderful uh, book. And you should treat yourself to these things because it makes you a more cultured person uh, and it makes you more intelligent and it just gives you a bunch of joy. Um, and I love it. I listen to 15 minutes before I go to bed sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'll go for a walk. My daughter will fall asleep. I put my headphones in and I go for a walk another mile or two and listen to another half hour of my Audible. I love Audible, as you guys know. Uh, you can thank them at audible underscore com and send your audible confirmation uh, to audible at launch.co and you'll be entered into a chance, uh, a contest to get an iPad mini signed by me. That is going to end on December 18th. So get those in. Go to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist, and you'll get your 30 day free trial. Let's get back to the program. Thank you, Audible. Were you pushed to that position as an entrepreneur by the VCs, do you think? Was it this constant pressure to grow and maybe it was at just a different time when VCs had a little more influence? Well, I think that what happened is that we had a couple acquisition offers up front early on and then it went a little bit cold for a while and we were fine. We wanted to actually make a real standalone business. Um, but what happened is that later we found out that for the big dollars at the time, like a hundred plus million dollars to buy your company, yeah. um, traditional news sites were afraid of Dig. Right. And you'd sit down with them and you'd say, well, what do you think of Dig? And they're like, well, crazy experiment, but I don't like the content on the front page. It doesn't really suit our readers and it yeah. doesn't, it's not. So, you know, I think Reddit would probably have to go through something similar today if they were ever to be sold. Right. Like, how do you sell that community and that, that like it, it, the potential of them, the backlash potential and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so we tried to clean it up, I think, which was the problem. Right. And, and we really should have just let it be what it was, which was something yeah. special and unique. Um, well, it all worked out. Obviously you started revision three at the, uh, during the same period of time and were able to sell that to discovery. Again, you were, and, and I always tell folks, I, you know, I, I think that you're a visionary. You're always five years ahead of everything. You, you were five years ahead of this YouTube movement, and you were able to sell this company as well. But I remember when you started it, Dig Nation <coughs> and a lot of the shows, the biggest issue you had was it was costing ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month to surf up the video files. Yeah, that was really tough. We, we were paying, and, and um, you know, you, we didn't host our, our videos, obviously, on YouTube, so we were paying CDNs for this, and, and it was really expensive. And luckily, we had some early sponsors that understood that this was a new thing. And so GoDaddy has paid us, you know, millions of dollars over the year, over the years um, for these videos. And um, they had our back and, and so did Netflix and some others. Um, and that really, Ford jumped on, on board and, and all these brands finally got it. But it took a little while. There was definitely a period of time there as well with that business where I was like, wow, is this really actually going to work out? And then it finally, yeah. finally took off. Now, you did something I, I always thought was pretty brave. You took a hit, like Dignation, you walked away from it. And you, you didn't let yourself be defined as the dig guy. Take me through your thinking there, that you, you just sort of moved on with your career. I mean, what was that like emotionally, being so well known as that brand, and then just saying, I'm going to be Kevin Rose, not the dig guy? Um, you know, it's it's hard uh, in that you've you spend so many years of your life. I mean, Dig was is it was wasn't just this like you know two or three year thing. I've spent seven plus years of my life there, 
um, until I, I left. And it was, it was difficult to walk away because I really, at the core of me, enjoy the innovation and everything that you guys are going to be doing uh, over the next couple of days. The, the idea of the really small teams and the iteration and the product side of stuff, um, that is just so much fun. Like there's, there's no better feeling than when you get that kind of bubbling and you can't sit still because you have an idea that hasn't ever seen the light of day. And I, I do enjoy that. And so like I, I lost that when I walked away from Dig. And it's funny, I was talking um, to Bill Morris, my, my boss at, at Google Ventures, and I said I would never leave for another VC firm. If I ever left, it would be to start something new. Um, because that is that thrill is is just the best thing in the world. I mean, you know, that's why you're a VC yeah. slash entrepreneur. Right, I can't get out of building. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so listen, angel investing, though, what a tear you went on. Uh, the hottest company in the Valley right now, a lot of people say, is next door. They just closed a huge round, and, and they've got incredible metrics. But look at the other things you invested in. I mean... Angelus, Facebook, Zynga, Fab, Twitter, Square, Foursquare, I mean, NGMoco, OMG Pop, both of those were sold. What do you attribute your success as an angel investor to? Because just objectively, you, you must have had done much better as an angel investor in terms of oh, return sure. than as an entrepreneur. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's uh, one of the things that I really enjoy is just I investing in the inevitable. Like when you see something that you know is just going to be a thing several years out. Yeah. Um, that's that's something that, you know, in the early days of Twitter, before the celebrities got on there, when you saw the follower count and you knew that that was a very defensible thing and it wasn't portable. If you have an email newsletter with somebody with 30,000 followers, you can move that around to any provider you want. Right. If you have 30,000 followers on Twitter, you can't move that around. And just seeing how you could tail people for the first time and little insights like that. So I think that with every little company here, you know, whether it's Ingimoco being one of the first mobile gaming companies, ex-EA executives, strong founding team, knowing that gaming on the iPhone was going to be huge. Um, Square, obviously, you know, p payments in your pocket for anyone and everyone. I mean, these are just things that you look at. And if you're lucky enough to, to know these people... Um, sometimes you have to fight to get into some of these deals, but you know, you look at that stuff and you're just like, in five years, this is going to be a billion, two billion, five billion dollar business. So right. um, uh, it's, it's that kind of gut that I think that you go on. What, what do you think your value is as an angel investor and now as a VC? I think that what I like doing with, with startups more than anything else is that early stage product brainstorming, like sitting down and with an entrepreneur, especially on the consumer side. And, you know, as a VC, you give them 10 or 15 ideas and they maybe take one and implement it. And you're excited because you got to see your one little idea actually hatched into the world and that's pretty cool. Um, but, you know, a lot of lessons learned, a lot of hiring practices, things that I've, I've done in the past and honestly, things that I've just really screwed up in the past that I try and take that. And I'm sure, I mean, we've all been doing this long enough yeah. now that you have a, a bunch of lessons that you try and pass on and hopefully help people avoid making those mistakes. And that can be... Everything from telling someone not to raise a round of funding, you know, just because they should keep growing and grow the valuation of their company. Like, yeah. just being real. I think the problem is that, like, you can't just be, especially if you're an entrepreneur, then turn investor. I think it's a lot better than just taking money from someone that's just a pure investor. Why? And just because you've been there and you know that, like, ultimately you don't want to screw these people over. I mean, like, they're, as an investor, I feel like, um, Joe Krause uh, from our team calls it like a check and a headache. Like you don't want to be that person that just like writes a check and then all of a sudden you're in their business all the time. Like these people are going through like so much and, and sacrifice from friends and family to hours of sleep to stress levels to you name it. The best thing you can do is just be a friend and just like be there and be, give them the truth. And that might mean something that hurts you as an investor, like telling them that they shouldn't raise money right now um, or you know, helping them walk them through firing their first or, or layoffs or whatever it may be. Like, and when you've been there and you know how hard it is to lay people off, like that's a, that's a really powerful thing. It's a really tough thing to have to deal with. What was that like? I mean, you did that at Dig, I take it? You had to <clears> yeah, I did that at Dig and take Revision 3. And then eventually we hired back up for Revision 3. But, well, take um, me to that day. I mean, what happened? Uh, it was just... how did um, you make that decision? You know, it's one of those things where um, you only have so many dollars left in the bank, and you have to look at your runway, and you say, if we cut 
10, 15% of the staff right now. It'll get, get us this that much further. And we know that based on traffic and our metrics and how things are kind of like going a little bit like this now versus just like that, which is the way you want it to be, that you have to figure some stuff out. And the best way is to trim now and, you know, live to see another day and to, to fight the battle again. So just uh, sitting down with employees and having people cry and having people just ask if it was them and then, you know, it's, it's, it's just a really tough time. It's a tough thing to go through. Um, but it does definitely make you stronger. How did you manage your own psychology, your own emotions as you, as you went through all this tumultuous times? Um, and then, of course, we had the financial crisis during all of this as well in 2008, 2009, when it seemed like everything was going to come apart. I mean, you, I've watched you mature from that kid we just saw on the video over a decade to becoming just such a great thinker and, and such a great mature entrepreneur. But what do you think were the key factors that took you from Kevin Rose 1.0 to sort of an elder statesman now? And you mentioned a little bit of gray hair on the side, but just this great elder statesman counselor from that kid. It's who, honestly just a lot of mistakes. It really is. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you and I have both been down this and, and, and done it and seen companies that we've worked with or been invested in go up and down. And it's just like, it's just trial and error. And, and it's understanding that that's not a bad thing. Like it's not, there's nothing wrong with failing. Like, like 95% plus percent of you will fail right in the next few days. Right. right. And it's just like, that, there's nothing wrong with that. You tried right. something new. That is the cool thing. Right. Is that you hatched your idea. Don't let anyone ever tell you that if you went and built something and it failed, that you're a failure. There's, that's not true. Because what did they do? They didn't build anything. They're just right. like sitting on the sides being haters. You see them on the, on the internet the blogs. all the time on the <laughs> blogs. Right. And it's like these are mostly people that are just sitting there hating on people, but they're not actually building anything. Right. And, you know, it's like look at Pincus from Zanga. And it's like how many companies did he start until he finally had a hit on his hands? Right. You know, like what was it, like 10 or 15 or something Freeloader, like Freeloader, tribe. There's yeah. a ton. And then, it, he, you know, he stumbles or trips yeah, a little bit and they just attack again, him. The knives come out. He gets right back up again and does it again. And it's just like you have to have that in your body and in, that, in your DNA to understand that failure is, is not a negative thing. Ah, uh, yes, Hiscox Small Business. I love you guys for giving me, Jason Calacana, small business insurance coverage for my companies. They, uh, you know, this whole thing of getting insurance, it's very hard. And it, it's too hard, it's too time consuming, and you feel like you're getting the runaround. These insurance brokers sometimes, I don't trust them. And I feel like, uh, there should be just like a an Uber of small business insurance. Well, guess what? That's what Hiscox Small Business is. It's like Uber for small business uh, insurance. You can get tailored coverage through a simple process on the web. You just pick what state you're in. You describe your business, and you'll get that like liability insurance, errors and omissions, general liability, business owners policies, workers comp, all that stuff that you need. Um, and it's super easy to do it. You could do it anytime, day or night. And over 96% of their customers will recommend them to a friend. And I'm one of that 96%. Competitive rate starting at only $22.50 a month. Not $22,000, not $22,000, not $22,000, $22.50 a month. It's just such a simple process. You fill out that online form, and Hiscox will email you your documents, and you're done. Uh, it's just fantastic when you uh, buy insurance directly through the insurer instead of an agent. You just get that tailored coverage in a much simpler process. Thank you so much to Hiscox Small Business uh, for supporting this program and small businesses. I know they're just big fans of startups and entrepreneurs, and, and that's why they have this actual product. HiscoxUSA.com slash small biz. H-I-S-C-O-X-U-S-A.com slash small biz. And everybody thank Hiscox Small Biz on their Twitter handle. These, the, this team over there does a great job. I use the product myself. And I'm such a lucky bastard. Let me tell you something. You look at all the people who get, do the ads on the program. They're all people whose products I actually use. That's the, white, the magic of whitelisted advertising on This Week in Startups. I made a list, the whitelist, of the top 25 products I use. And then the sales team, they went and said, hey, who wants to be partners on the program? And Jason will read your ad. Because he can read it because he uses your product and he loves it. And Hiscox is one of those companies. I love their product. And I have no problem reading their ad because I would tell you if we're having drinks at the battery, I'd tell you the same thing. Get Hiscox. All right, let's get back to the program. Um, let's talk about this Angelus syndicate thing that came out of nowhere. Um, when did you first hear about this from no – you're an investor in – Yeah, through Google Ventures. Yeah. You guys invested in Angelus. So take me through what the syndicate is, how you found out about it, and what you think happened here because I'm looking at the statistics right now. 
this is under 30 days old, I believe, or just about that. <coughs> you have 582 people backing your syndicate for $2.5 million per deal. And uh, that's more than the next couple of people combined. What is the syndicate and what impact will it have? So, you know, I remember Naval was uh, telling me about this probably uh, about a year ago. And, you know, this Jobs Act um, came out and, uh, and allows basically solicitation where you can go out and you can say, I am raising a fund, like, do you want to back me? Right. And so what, basically what you're seeing here is on AngelList, you can go, and now I have 582, like, uh, kind of micro in investors that come in and put in small dollar amounts, anywhere from $1,000 to, some, in some cases, fifty dollars or $75,000 per deal. And then they back you, and then every time you go out and you do a deal, um, everyone gets a little slice of that deal. Um, one person goes on the cap table, and um, it essentially allows me to act as a micro VC. Now, in real life, I, I play a, a VC at Google Ventures, right? So I'm actually not taking any carry. So I don't make any money on these deals when I do them. Um, I just do it for free, right? Just because I think I don't know the the, the I feel like this is going going to be a thing. It already is obviously a thing, but like if you can imagine five, ten years from now. Um, these numbers are going to make and empower individuals to be basically like small little venture capital firms, but through one person. And none of us have done a deal with this yet. I mean, there have been people who've done syndicates on Angelus, but not the backer uh, sort of situation. You've got a lot of deal flow. When do you anticipate you'll do one of these? And how much of that 2.5 do you think will actually manifest itself in a deal? Because none of us actually know that either, I don't think. So, well, here's the thing that's interesting about this. Um, I feel like the best deals are the hardest ones to get in, obviously, yeah. and there are oftentimes not a whole lot of room available for in investment. Meaning in like dollar amounts. Dollar amounts. Like there'll be 50 or 100K available left in the round. Right. And so the last thing I want to do to these people, especially because you, you know that there's a lot of, these are all accredited investors, so they have a decent amount of money. But there's a lot of people in here that don't have a ton of money, so I don't. I get really nervous. So I want to make sure the deals that I bring forward are just nothing but the best when I go out and do these. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I'm taking my time. I'm not going to like spray and pray here and do you know 50 deals a year. I want to do like four or five deals a year. Um, but I, I think that uh, you're probably going to see my deals are going to be ones where I bring 100k to the table. And they'll have to split it up amongst those people, just because there won't be that much room left in left in the round. Right. So you envision Google puts in money, Google Ventures puts right. in two fifty or five hundred into an angel round, and there's a hundred or two hundred left. And uh, either on a percentage basis, those people will come in, or first come first serve. Right. And then the other thing is, I, I want to bring in some later stage stuff as well. I think ah. it'd, be, it'd be interesting to go and talk to someone like Pinterest and say, "Hey, can I have a couple million dollars with your next round?" just for syndicating out to, to do this crew here. Um, when you look back now, being on both sides of the table, pitching, and in, at times, obviously, desperate to get that money in as an entrepreneur, now being on the other side of the table, what, what do you think makes people want to invest in a company? When, when you know, they just say This is like, great for this audience, actually. Yeah. Like, so obviously, I meet with a, a ton of entrepreneurs every single week. Um, there's a couple things that I think are key when you guys are going out there and pitching uh, uh, venture capitalists or angels. One, I think, is just um, the fact that you have an original idea. Mm -hmm. This can't be Pinterest for cats or you know just another knockoff. Because so derivative ideas are a huge turnoff. They're a turnoff for me unless it's like. Actually, I'm just going to be honest, they're always a turn off for me. They're, there's not really, I, even Yammer, I was like, I don't want to do Yammer. It's just Twitter yeah. for business. Right. And I, I couldn't get behind it, but I obviously it did extremely well. Fantastic, sure. Um, but So, so you're it, looking for original thinking. Clearly. Original thinking, uh, they have to be a little bit crazy. I kind of like that. Yeah. You know, just like this, this ready to take on the world. Um, and... Oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of the other traits. What about execution now? Because in the early days, we saw how you, you built Dig in a Craigslist, eBay-type fashion. Like, we'll get to design later, right? And today, man, everything looks really polished. Does your product have to look really polished to raise money today? I think on mobile it does. You only get 
uh, you only get one chance on mobile. I believe when a user takes the time to go and download and install your application, if there isn't, especially on Apple, Android, you can get away with whatever because all the apps look horrible. Um, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. I work for Google, but um, Google Measures. Um, <laughs> different, different. Uh, there's some good Android apps, right. I, and I'm getting the Nexus 4. Yeah. Um, so I feel that the, the fit and finish has to be there on the Apple, pro, Apple side. Right. It just really does. I mean, I don't care if you have to go out and find someone on Dribbble and hire them as a freelancer. You have to have that polish in your application. If a user doesn't like it, they uninstall it, they think it looks crappy, the barrier to entry the second time around, I mean, you're not going to get a user to go out and get so excited that they're going to go and download the app one more time and reinstall it. I mean, it's, it's really difficult. So um, certainly on mobile... The web, not so much. I think that you can iterate a little bit more on the, on the web. But, um, but yeah, I certainly believe that design is a very important element. I'm seeing a lot more like designer founders now, oh. uh, which is really interesting. You were onto that early. I mean, with Daniel Berka, who was, I think, your sort of Johnny Ive in a way. Was that fair to say? Sure. Yeah, Dan Daniel was, has been an awesome designer and partner of mine for many years. And, and now he's at Google Ventures as well. <clears throat> yeah, so he's going out and helping out all, the, all of our portfolio companies. Well, what's the scope, and then we'll get to questions from the audience, what's the scope of Google Ventures activity now? And should people, obviously with corporate venture capital, people get a little nervous like, hey, it, is the search group going to find <laughs> out about this? Or how, how do you firewall the ideas between the ventures group and the corporate group? And should people be worried about that? Or why yeah. shouldn't they? I mean, that's, that's the beautiful thing. That's the only reason I joined Google Ventures. I would not have joined uh, GV if it was primarily only a uh, strategic fund. It's not to Google at all. In fact, it, there's very much a firewall in place. So they created a separate company. Google acts as the funds coming in, but they don't have insight and visibility into our companies, what they're working on. And so we keep that all separate. And in fact, I mean, the mandate has been go out and invest in things that are potentially even competitive to Google. They'd rather own a, a, next, a piece of the next Facebook than not, or right. whatever it may be, the next big search engine, you name it. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, that's been awesome. And so that gives us pretty much free reign to go out and invest in anything and everything. Um, you know, we do life sciences, we do, uh, consumer, you name it, like enterprise. Um, and you know, we do everything from a hundred K seed check all the way up to Uber, which we wrote $254 million check into. Yeah. Why is Uber so special? It's, um, it's all the things we like. Crazy founder. Travis, uh, super awesome. disruptive, yep. uh, uh, makes a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just um, they've they've got big bold plans, and I think that if you take a look at the way that plays into some of our strengths and some of the connections that we can make on the Google side, yeah, uh, you know, whether it's maps and traffic or you name it, um, self-driving cars. Yeah, or, I'm, I'm not connection. saying they're working on that. I'm just saying that those are things that you could see yeah. uh, partnerships uh, happening. So uh, I'm excited. Are you enjoying it? You enjoy being a VC? You know, it, it, I would say that um, I love it and hate it. I, I hate it when I see an idea and a team get so excited and they just go off and execute and you're just like, oh, I want to get back in there. You know, you just yeah. want to like, you want to do it. Um, but it, it is also really exciting to find something that you play with and for the first time you, you're like, this is going to be huge. Right. And I'm going to be the first check into this business. This is going to be amazing like this is it's going to have a great return and that that side is also really exciting and you just know it's going to change the world and you're helping fund something that's going to change the world that's a really cool feeling all right let's get ready to take a question from the audience my final question to you though is are we going to see another kevin rose startup are we going to see you as a founder again what are the chances give me a percentage chance that kevin rose gets back in the game back it's kind of like game. jordan retiring oh, what's the geez. chances you get back in the game I appreciate you saying that, but... 50-50, um, 60-40? Uh, I'd say probably 75%. That you'll get back in at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty much a lock you'll get back in there. I don't know about a lock, but it has to be something that I'm just like, I'm really over the top sold on and passionate about, and that, that I, I won't do it if it's just like, the last company I did was more of a labs company where we was just exploring different ideas. Yeah, but you did Oink and you... Yeah, stuff. but I didn't really have anything that I was ready to sink my teeth into, and right. so I think that I would have to really be sold on something. Right. Um, I do like, I do like um, decentralized digital currencies a lot, and so Bitcoin has got me pretty, pretty excited. Hot and bothered? Hot and bothered a little bit. You sold all your Bitcoins today. I did, yeah. 
I sold them over the last couple of days. Three hundred dollars a big. I like riding these waves. When it drops back down again, I'll buy some more. All right, I believe a, the currency, just not the bubbles. Let's take a question from the audience. Uh, we have a microphone we can run and maybe bring up the lights a little bit. And let's. Oh, there it is. Okay, let's get a uh, good Simon. Give it the microphone to somebody. Clear, concise question, please. And and the folks in the background, if you're talking out there, just take it outside, please. And to my staff, just tell them to shh back there. Okay, go ahead. What do you see is going to take us to get to $100 billion companies? We've got billions of users. What's it going to take? Is it crowdfunding? Is it mobile international payments? Is it real-world disruption? What's going to get us out of the $10, $5, $10, $15 $15 billion window? Because... So I guess super unicorns. Who's the next? Facebook. I think you know, Nextdoor has a shot at it. Being a super unicorn. Yeah, I think not that, just a five billion company, but a hundred billion. Yeah, I do. I, Why? I think that because they have discovered a graph that no one's paying attention to, which is the neighborhood graph. The idea that like relationships with neighbors can actually create. Um, you can build applications on top of this graph and do things like neighborhood watch. You can do secure and trusted commerce with, with friends and neighbors. I think that eventually, if they do it right, it'll eat Craigslist. Um, oh, really? Absolutely. You're seeing it happening right now. Like, if you join the Petrero Hill, or the Petrero Hill, I think, is the, the most popular one in San Francisco. Um, it is just taking off, and people are talking about everything from, you know, kids lost a backpack to... There's a, uh, a, uh, someone like l- lurking around cars out here late at night to I have this couch for sale. Like You can see it starting to eat some of uh, Craigslist traffic. Great. Another question from the audience. Nice and clear, concise question. Run. <laughs> Let's run. Okay. I feel bad. I want to see these guys hack. I'm like, yeah, this is a long time. Let's, we, we got two um, minutes left. Two more questions. Go. So... <laughs> One thing that I've noticed is in the Silicon Valley, we're just starting to get this bubble feel where as a student, um, it seems like the plan for our life is start a startup, quit college, start a startup, get rich, and then live life happily. Um, do you think that that's a sustainable... It for Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but do you think that that's... And like I see that it's treated you pretty well, but do you think it's a sustainable model or do you think we should see some change in the upcoming years? Yeah, does it feel like a bubble to you, Kev? Um, it does in some ways, actually. What feels like a bubble? What 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 makes the you rents, worried? The rents worry me. Okay. The fact that no one can afford rent here is is really um, uh, troublesome. Uh, it it feels well. It's just like I see um, the issue that we're having now. Actually, you know, Angelus is kind of starting this. Is every entrepreneur that has a accu hire exit and has a, a million or two dollars instantly becomes another angel and is funding more startups. So you're seeing more and more. F- like money flow into the ecosystem and that attracts more people and the rents go up, the cost of living here goes up and then all of a sudden, um, you know, we're seeing more startups that obviously are going to have a hard time raising their Series A and I just, that feels a little out of whack to me. So the number of companies being started but the truth is if they fail, no one gets hurt. Nobody gets hurt anymore. Nobody gets hurt. That's nice. I mean, it would, yeah. Okay, let's take a... But oh. stay in school. I say, I tell you to quit. Uh, uh, go ahead, here we go. Final question. Yeah, uh, I actually saw you in the elevator and I give you a quick elevator pitch. How did um, you do? It was, it was like a 10 second pitch. I didn't even understand what he was saying. Yeah. So, that was, you <laughs> so I, I was Bad asking, pitch. I didn't hear what you were saying. All right, here we go, one more time. So You have 20 seconds, three, two, go. Yeah, I'm a Chad with Bitwall and we do micro transactions for digital publishers. We allow people to tweet, view ads, or pay to view content. Okay, micropayments for content. Okay, what do you think? Um, I think that micropayments are gonna get really interesting now that Bitcoin exists, oh. um, just because it's possible. And, and some, when there's something, a uh, really lightweight way to do that, I think it's gonna be um, interesting to think about rather than some crazy monthly New York Times $10 subscription to be like, hey, this article, the first half of this article is really interesting. Here's, you know, five cents in bitcoins. Let me unlock the second half. Yeah. You know, things like that. Um, uh, with no transaction fees, you know, Amazon tried to do this. They had a really lightweight, yeah. like, micropayment system. It was a tip jar. It was like, yeah, but you had to buy, like, $5 at a time or $10 at a time. And then there was, like, too a, hard. a 10 cent fee here and a five cent fee here. It was just, like, I, I think it's possible now. So I, I'm excited. I, I, I will, I know I followed your company on AngelList, so I, I'll check it out some more. 
And uh, okay, so that's it. Let's get everybody back to work. Uh, Kevin, you've been incredibly honest and insightful. Let's get a big round of applause. Thanks, guys. Kevin Rose. Now, good luck to all of you. Kevin has also agreed to take a meeting yes. with the winners of the event. Yep. So they'll get to come to Potrero or Google and have a coffee Anywhere or tea. Well, tea. You're a tea guy. I do both. So Samovar Tea Lounge, what's going to happen? Samovar sounds good. I also invest in Blue Bottle Coffee, so that's good Okay, as well. so it's like, what, is a half-hour meeting? <laughs> yeah, sure. It sounds good. All right, so two half-hour meetings are up. Uh, once again, Kevin Rose. Thanks, everybody.